All right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming to our first Five for Five of this season. Uh, my name is Courtney Cosden. I am a soil health instructor with University of Idaho Extension and NRCS. Uh, so this is our um, Idaho Soil Health Five for Five roundtable. So the way that this works is um, each of our producers, so we have three amazing producers today that are going to talk to us about soil health economics, which is a very exciting um, newer topic. Um, a lot of case studies came out this year about soil, about these producers and how they're incorporating soil health practices and how it has benefited them financially. Um, but so, with, so the way this works is the producers um, have five slides and five minutes or less to um, present their information. And we're gonna kind of switch it up a little bit today because we only have three producers. So we're gonna give them a little bit more time. We'll call it more of like a 10 for 10, even if they don't have 10 slides, that's no worries, but they can talk for about 10 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, we really appreciate you all being here. We're super excited about this. This is our first time that we've done a five for five with a theme. Um, and we're gonna try to carry that on this year to do different themes for each five for five. And we'll have, two more five for fives, one I think at the beginning of February and then another one at the end of March. So keep an eye out for the emails for me about when those start. And I'm also gonna put in the chat our YouTube link for where the rest of the um, five for fives are located, the past five for fives, so you can check those out. Um, I also wanted to introduce Sean Neald, who is our state soil scientist with NRCS, um, who we, yeah, we kind of run these together and he'll help me facilitate some of the questions, but um, please, so the producers will be presenting their information and then we'll do questions for each producer immediately following their presentation. So think of questions. This is, um, yeah, this is a time for you, get, for you to get to know the producers and ask all of your questions, especially about this topic that is really exciting to listen to. Um, so with that, I think we can get started and we're going to start with Mr. Pat Purdy. Um, and yeah, whenever you're ready, Pat, you can get going. Okay, great. Thank you, Courtney. Good morning, everybody. My name's Pat Purdy. My family owns and operates Peekaboo Livestock Company out of Peekaboo, Idaho. And I am, uh, I've got the sunny Puerto Vallarta here in the background of me right now, even though I'm not there. So I like my background better than Courtney's because, well, I like, I like her, I like her vandal theme. So I got to, that's, that's good. So I'm going to go through some some slides that uh, Ellen Yateman uh, with American Farmland Trust put together on a case study that she did on our farm. And so I want to make sure I give credit to her. This is this is her presentation and I'm just uh, borrowing it. So I'm going to skip through um, these first few slides. Um, <clears throat> and so she did a, a, a case study kind of prior to implementation of of regenerative practices and post implementation. And so I, 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 she did a lot of work with my nephew and I provided a lot of data to her. So yield data, cost data, a lot of financial data that we provided to her, uh, again, on machinery, fertilizer, pesticide yields, uh, uh, you know, learning costs, et cetera, prior to our implementation of, of where we started bringing in no-till and regenerative practices in 2014, and then kind of I think it was four year post. So, so she had some good before and after, good before and after data. And she's an economist and uh, did a, I think did a great job putting all this together. So, um, and so at least four years um, of, of, of after successful adoption. Again, it was a, it was we didn't just start in 2014 and convert to no-till. We started, we we did our very first implementation in 2014 of a few acres. We grew those acres to you know, four or 500 acres in 2015, and then say a thousand acres in 2016. And then we just, we basically just grew the acres um, through that, uh, through the, that time frame. And really essentially the way we implemented no-till was we're a, we're, we've got a lot of, uh, of a dairy hay and, and a lot of malt barley. And so we have a, a, a fairly straightforward rotation. We also got some mustard seed in our rotation, but we would essentially chemically terminate our alfalfa. And instead of plowing it up, we would just no-till barley into that alfalfa. And so essentially that field was in no-till four years prior to that because we, we we tilled it, put it into alfalfa, 
And then we took it out four years later chemically and no-tilled barley into that alfalfa. So we, we kind of got a running start on no-till implementation in that using that practice. And then we just started no-tilling from that point forward. Um, so her, you know, again, her study was really uh, before versus after approach. Um, and okay, so here we go. Economic case study for Pikachu livestock, right? So here's here's uh, my nephew, myself, and my, my father. He's... Uh, uh, 83 and still very involved. My nephew's in his mid thirties. And so we have kind of three generations working the farm right now. So here's some of the data, Blaine County, Idaho, about 4,800 total acres uh, of, of farm ground that, so we, 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 we own about 3,500 acres. We lease a bunch of other ground. A lot of our ground is also in irrigated pasture. Um, but in total, we, we, we have about 4,500 acres of cash crop ground between uh, malt, barley, dairy, hay, and uh, mustard. The study area was only on 1,800 acres, however, so she limited the study area to some, you know, some specific acreage so that she could uh, collect the data a little bit more quickly. And so, uh, so here's our soil health practice implementation. Uh, 2014, very first implementation of no-till. We also started uh, converting our alfalfa um, fertility program off of synthetic fertilizer over to um, uh, a fall applied uh, compost application. And then we, then we started doing some cover cropping after our barley on a, on a limited basis in the 2015 and 2016 timeframe. All right, so this is kind of an overview of the, the, the data that you will see here uh, in, in a minute, but uh, we, had a, we had about $117,000 net income chain. Again, this is on this 1800 acres only, right? This isn't farm wide, this is, $117,000 of net income change on the, 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 that total of 1,800 acres, uh, $65 an acre of, of annual net income increase or 136% uh, ROI. <clears throat> and so some of the, the no, some of the, uh, the soil health practices, again, we, we started transitioning to no-till. Uh, she says all acres, to be honest, it's, it's all acres except for two categories. We do, we do sublease some ground or uh, to uh, a seed potato grower in the area. So somewhere between 100 and 200 acres annually, we, we, we lease to a, a seed potato grower. Obviously difficult to do that in a no-till practice. Uh, we also have, um, we implemented a couple hundred acres of organic uh, in, late in this period. And that, uh, again, those acres were, were definitely tilled. Those of you who are involved in organic realize that that's difficult to do without tillage. So, um, so we've got a, a mix of, of spring uh, malt barley um, and, um, and dairy hay. We moved to 100% dairy manure or dairy manure compost application to alfalfa. And we also started implementing a liquid split application of fertilizer to barley. We moved away from, from a, kind of a 100% upfront dry application of, of uh, fertilizer to, uh, to split applications of uh, of liquid, so we we pretty much use 100% liquid fertilizer now. So we're uh, we've got ongoing work that we've done since this study period, where we've implemented um, e even additional split applications of fertilizer, experimenting with reducing our synthetic fertilizer applications using using SAP analysis as our as a, a kind of a driving data source to help guide our fertilizer applications. But those things happened after this study; they're not included in this particular study. <clears throat> So we talked about what are the, you know, why did, why did we do this? Um, you know, we really uh, got into farming with my dad back in 20, 2008 and really felt like we had to, we had to change our practices. We have, we have wind erosion issues and we have water erosion issues. We farm in a, let me back up. We farm in a, a really um, environmentally sensitive area. What you don't see here is there's a is there's a, a world famous trout stream that runs through this property of ours, and that trout stream has experienced a pretty heavy silt load over the last 100 years, primarily due to uh, agricultural practices, uh, both letting cattle graze up against the stream banks, but mostly the ex extensive tillage that's done in the area, and then the wind erosion and the water erosion that picks up that, uh, that topsoil and brings it into the stream. And so we said, you know, we've got to stop doing that. I, I don't know about you all on the call, but, but it just is heartbreaking to see your topsoil blowing away every spring. And uh, that was an annual event for us. And uh, I just said, you know, we, we, we can't let this happen anymore. We, we just cannot 
<clears throat> allow that that wind erosion that happens every single spring when we have our fields bare. Um, and really, probably one of the other key factors was when you really get it in your brain that your soil is a living biological system. It is not just inert, uh, you know, sand and silt and clay that holds the plant up and provides soil and nutrients to the to the roots. It's it's a living biological system. You you really, I think. I think ethically, morally, have, are, are, are forced to make a change in how you treat your soil. You can't, you got to stop treating it like dirt. You've got to start treating it like a living biological system. And so this is what we're looking for. We love these kind of pictures where we've got all these, you know, these root holes, the, the, I'm sorry, these, um, these worm holes with the roots yes. down through the worm holes. It's just, you know, I love it when I dig it, get us get a, get a shovel full of, of soil that looks like this. <clears throat> all right. So we got to move on to the financials of this. So, Here's some of the data on the increases in income. Um, we, we, we felt like we got a, a, about a third ton increase in our cover crop grazing efficiency. So we, we've always grazed our barley residue. We've always uh, uh, run our pivots on our barley residue, got our regrowth and, and grazed that in the fall. Well, by putting the cover crop in, we felt like we got some, uh, maybe, maybe as much as a third of a ton of additional grazing opportunity. Cause sometimes that can, you can get as many as two different grazing cycles in the fall, depending on the weather, how early you can get your cover, cover crop in. So about $22,000 of additional income there. We did also see about a five bushel per acre <clears throat> increase in our barley yields. Um, and so total net increase of about $149,000 of net income increase due to the increase in yield and the, uh, the, 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 the grazing, the additional grazing in income that we felt like we're getting. Uh, we also had some pretty significant decreases in cost. We just, we just don't go over, over our fields nearly as often. Our, the, the, my main field pass is with my sprayer, right? I do own my own sprayer. That's, that's the piece of machinery that goes over my fields more than anything right now. And, it, and for those of you that operate a sprayer, those are, they're expensive to purchase, but they're one of the least expensive pieces of equipment to operate just because they, they cover acres so quickly. Um, we moved away from applying um, fertilizer, or I'm sorry, insecticide. We also made a move in, in eliminating all insecticide applications on our alfalfa and our barley. Um, we just made the conscious decision to say, you know, we're going to stop doing that. We also, it's not mentioned here, but we also moved away from using any fungicide applications on our barley. No fungicide seed treats and no, no uh, post-plant fungicide applications on our barley. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to improve, improve my biodiversity. I'm trying to build biodiversity. And so by applying fungicide to my soil and then my seed treat, I'm essentially one foot on the brake, one foot on the gas kind of situation where I'm, I'm both working to improve soil um, the biodiversity. I'm also trying to kill it at the same time. So I, I, it just didn't make sense to me to continue to use insecticides. Now, does, do we pay a price for that sometimes? I'd say absolutely. I go out and I scout my fields and I see, I see, uh, uh, you know, thrips. I see, you know, I see uh, uh, weevil and I just have to kind of, you know, grip my teeth and, and uh, walk away. And depending on how bad it is, I may decide to cut that field a little bit sooner than I might otherwise. But what we got ourselves into was kind of a cycle of every time I sprayed, I had to spray again, and then I had to spray again. So I found myself in some cases spraying three times a season because I got into a cycle of killing off my beneficials. Now I have a completely unprotected field. The, 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 the pests move in again. So I go back out and I spray again, <laughs> kill off my beneficials again. And so I just, I just like I stop the insanity. I feel like I'm just a rat, you know, running on a wheel here. And so I'm just spraying over and over and over again. And we just said, no more, I'm just going to stop doing that. And so um, the only exception we've made to this is if we do have, uh, if we do have grasshoppers coming into our fields from where they're up against, uh, uh, you know, rangeland BLM ground, which we do have a lot of that around us, we will spray the uh, they may be one strip around the outside of the field to try and keep the uh, keep the grasshoppers out of the fields because they can of course be devastating to an alfalfa field so that would be the one exception we would make would just be a kind of a field boundary application to control grasshoppers so we've had to do that i think twice in the last maybe 10 years um so all right going through all this so total decreases in net cost, 53, almost 54,000, 149,000 uh, uh, increase in income, total $203,000 uh, 
net income increase, and that's where the $113 an acre comes from. So now there, there, there was no identified net decrease in, in, in no identified in decrease in net income, um, but there is some there is some additional cost which we incurred. Cover crop seed doesn't come for free, right? So we were paying for cover crop seed. Uh, we definitely have uh, in, increased our both our soil sampling and our sap sampling. So we're spending some additional money. We're going to some labs outside of the area so that we can get a, a much broader sample, particularly on our soil test. We're getting, we're doing a Haney test. We're doing a, a, a what's called a SLAN test. We're doing a soil uh, uh, aggregate, uh, aggregate stability test. Um, so we're, we're running a lot more than just your traditional Olson Bray, you know, chemical extraction uh, soil test method. If you wanted to get my direct opinion on if you're running purely chemical extraction soil tests, I, I, I guess I felt like we were wasting our money doing that. I didn't feel like we got any benefit from that information because it didn't really seem to correlate with anything that we were doing uh, in the field. So we've essentially switched off of that type of testing. So we're spending a little bit more money on soil testing. Um, we we saw a little bit of an increase in the uh, the cost to apply compost to our alfalfa because we used to we used to spend maybe you know 60 65 dollars an acre and we and we bumped that up to closer to uh to 80 to 100 dollars an acre on our compost application um machinery cost increase so this would be you know there was a decrease in machinery cost for fewer field passes but then there's a corresponding you know i go over my field more often with my sprayer so there's this is an offsetting increase so there's a, both a decrease in in machinery cost and then also an increase i think these machinery costs have become much more significant uh, now the machinery cost decrease has become much more significant if you compared it today with what it takes to do say maybe three tillage passes compared with no tillage passes that we do, but I'm doing it with a spray rig instead. The cost of the equipment, the cost of the fuel, the cost of the iron to maintain that. Uh, I think there's a significant delta now in, in cost savings uh, for a no-till system versus a conventional till system just in the, the diesel and the iron and the equipment cost alone. So I, th I think that's gotten much more substantial than it was during this study period prior to this big in inflationary period that we've gone through. Okay. So I'm having to go through this pretty quickly. So if we have any questions here, I'll be happy to answer them. <clears throat> Again, so to summarize, um, total net income increases, total net um, decrease in, or increase in, in expenses. It's, she, she's calling a decrease in net income, but this is really an increase in in, um, in expenses, obviously resulting in a decrease in net income. <clears throat> so the net here, sorry, decrease net income, $117,000 of total net income increase. Yeah, so the 203 minus the 86 give us $117,000 of total net income increase, $65 an acre, 136% ROI. So I think I got it done in, well, more than five minutes, sorry. <laughs> that was fine, great job, Pat. Um, yeah, we can take any questions for Pat now. Is it uh, Pat? Yes, hey, Tim. Uh, yeah, how are you? Hey, very well done. Uh, you're gonna make me look really bad in this presentation, so thank you. No. <laughs> Not, very, yeah, yeah and, uh, and I love your mission. I love what you're doing. I, it makes all the sense in the world to me. And uh, God, well done. You know, uh, one thing I could say about the insects, you know, <clears throat> I always started putting like ladybugs. I'd buy buckets of ladybugs and put them out a little bit early and let right. them just kind of do their magic. And then the microscopic wasp, they come in these little uh, flat cards. I don't know if you know much about the microscopic wasp. I, I, I No, I don't. That's something new to me. Yeah. So the, the microscopic wasps, you can't even see them. I mean, they're just naked to the, almost to the eye, but uh, we, we take these, and they come on a, a, a card and you put them out in the field and they will uh, help annihilate the, um, the aphid. Okay. And, and, uh, and then also they will uh, sting the, um, the mill uh, when you get a corn worm, right. That egg, what they do is they go after that egg and they sting it and they lay like 500 eggs in that, in that, in the egg of that, bug and then they hatch and then they just multiply and just take out all the the uh, 
the aphid and stuff like that. Where do you get these? Expensive. Where do you get these from? Uh, I can't remember. I I had uh, Nick order me some more. I I can get your phone number later, Pat. Or and, and if anybody needs my number, I can just give it to you. It's two zero eight three zero eight six seven nine nine, and um, I'd be glad to get that information for you. I think that'd be a great tool for you. Yeah, that sounds like and, that'd and, be and very interesting. And you're so right. Once you kill all of the beneficials, you just absolutely. And it's tough. And but you've so, got a defenseless field. I mean, you're, you've got no defense systems in your field now because you just wiped out every beneficial in the field. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and we we had a we as an example, we had probably the worst um, cereal leaf beetle infestation that I've seen on our fields this year on about 185 acres of barley. Definitely going to cause economic damage. Talked to my agronomist uh, Jared Cook with Rocky Mountain Agronomics, and we decided to. Uh, to not spray that field with an insecticide, but instead use a, oh goodness, what the heck was it? Um, I want to say it was a silica compound that we used. Um, unfortunately, my memory is not as good as it used to be, but we we sprayed that field and and he said, you know, he's seen it maybe 50-50 where it's worked sometimes and other times it hasn't worked. And uh, went out there about three or four days after the spray application and they, and they were gone, no more. No more cereal leaf beetle. I mean, it was just almost, it was amazing the, the, how, how much it cleaned it up. And of course, I didn't, I didn't knock out any of my beneficials with that application. And so it, uh, there are other tools in the toolbox. Pest, insecticides are cheap and they're very easy to use. I mean, that's, that's the compelling thing. It's like, oh man, just throw this in. It's only $4 an acre. You can take a ride with your, with your, with your grain spray herbicide. You, you know, you get convinced to do those things. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever talks to you about the unintended consequences of what that's going to cost you um, in knocking out all your beneficials. And it might be later that season. It might be next year. I mean, but you're going to see a, you're going to see a consequence to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, well done. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, Pat? Yeah, this is uh, Daniel Blade. I'm with NRCS in New Mexico. Hey, Daniel. I just wanted to know, uh, have you had uh, interest with, with fellow farmers? Have you been able to kind of share this? And, and, and have you had some pushback? It's like uh, some skepticism. Oh, I think I've had lots of skepticism, sure. I mean, I've, I've had some train wrecks. I mean, we've made some mistakes. We've done some dumb stuff. Honestly, with our organic as much as anything, that's, that's, I've had plenty of train wrecks on my organic. But um, in, in my regenerative practices, sure. I mean, I, even I, even, some, you know, sometimes it bothers me. I'll, you know, I love the, the look of those nice straight, you know, rows, barley in the, you know, in the dark soil, you drive by them in the spring and it's beautiful. I mean, I, 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 I kind of miss that. Honestly, I drive my field by my fields in the spring and they're all, of course, right along the highway. And uh, what do I've got? I've got barley stubble or alfalfa stubble from the prior year that that barley is growing up inside of. You can't see the nice, fresh, you know, new growth of barley. All you can see is the stubble or you can see the dead alfalfa from the prior year. And, you know, that doesn't look very good for quite a while. So, yeah, it's it's uh, you've got to be willing to endure, um, you know, a little bit of ribbing and a little bit of, you know, it just it, 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 it doesn't it, it doesn't look good. It's I, th I think Gabe Brown or somebody talked about it farming, farming dirty. I mean, you're just, it's, it, it's, it's, it looks messy. It looks dirtier until the crop is up, you know, six, eight inches. Then it looks every bit, if not better, every bit as good, if not better than everybody else's fields. But that first, that first month in the spring can be pretty hard to endure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great presentation. All right. Hey, Pat, uh, this is Lance Griff. And I just had a question. Um, where do you get your compost from and do you ever use raw manure? We are too far away from the raw manure sources to be economical. I would definitely consider using raw manure if I could get it economically, but being where we are, there are no dairies, you know, within 50 to 70 miles of us. So we get it through Magic Valley Compost. Ray Saline of Magic Valley Compost brings work with him every year and those guys do a great job. They haul it, spread it, you know, so we, um, so yeah, it, Love, love to use raw manure if I could do it, but I just can't. Hey, Marlon. Uh, this is this is Marlon. Uh, uh, before I retire, I'm hoping to find one per, per person that's interested in growing their own cover crop seed. Uh, Gabe Brown used to talk about making his own 
planting his own six way mix, right? Kind of his base mix. And I, have you considered that yet, Pat, or is it too much? We we have grown do? some of our own seed for our own purposes. I've grown some. I've grown some. Uh, uh, some winter some forage winter wheat seed i've grown some peas i've grown some you know some barley i haven't i've not grown anything for commercial purposes um might dabble in that at some point yeah i might i might dabble in that um you know i would be a little concerned about my i i, I still you know i still fight a little bit of a battle with weed control and that's you know when you're growing a multi-species cover crop blend you pretty much can't spray anything right so you got to you got to make sure you got a pretty clean field to do that with if you're going to sell that seed commercially. Thank you. Oh, um, and Pat, we have a question in the chat. How did you apply your liquid manure? Have you applied any mixes of beneficial fungi and bacteria? Okay, so yeah, to clarify, we don't use liquid manure. It's all it's all dry dairy compost. We are just way too far away to be hauling water, right? We can't, we can't haul liquid manure and we also, you know, we can't do raw manure because there's just too much, too much water content in it to be hauling water as far as we are away. So we've got to definitely haul dry manure. Freight is the biggest component of our compost uh, expense. Um, beneficials, yes, we have definitely been working on uh, applying beneficials. We are, are experimenting primarily with seed treats with uh, fungus, uh, fungicidal seed treats. Um, and we're starting to try to produce some of our own. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of the Johnson Sioux beam bioreactors where you, where you uh, compost this uh, uh, fungally dominant uh, uh, compost throughout the season. And then you can, you can we've got a, a, a compost extractor where we can make compost tea and uh, put that in our, our liquid. We have a liquid injection system on our no-till drill. So we do run a, we do run a John Deere, here it is. Yeah, we run a John Deere 1890 no-till drill air seeder. So hooked behind this now, we have a, we have a 1200 gallon uh, liquid cart that we pull behind this drill and we have retrofitted an intelligent, no, I'm sorry, a, a, a Surefire, Surefire Ag Systems liquid application system onto this drill. And so we're running a mixture of uh, beneficial uh, fungi and uh, and some liquid fertilizer in that. So we're doing an in row uh, an in row injection uh, as we plant now. And I'm happy to you know answer any questions directly. If you, can, you know you can share my phone number, share my email address. Um, I'm happy to take phone calls, happy to give a, a tour up on the farm, show our equipment. I've, I've helped out another couple, couple guys who I've been working with. And, uh, you know, I had some great mentorship in this journey and, uh, I'm happy to, to provide that happy to, to help, uh, other people avoid the mistakes that we've made and, and kind of make some of the, make some of the decisions up front correctly. Well, thanks for that, Pat. That's really right. generous of you to be able to share your time and knowledge. Um, and thanks so much for presenting with us today. All right. Great. Thank you. I will stop um, my sharing. Yes, that would be great. And Mr. Tim Corney is up next. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Corney and uh, co-owner of Thousand Springs Mill. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, split between farming and also uh, cleaning and packaging and putting into retail. So we kind of went from field to table on a, on a large scale. We uh, purchased the Pillsbury plant in Buell, Idaho, and we converted to uh, a non-GMO uh, organic facility. And uh, so my whole, my farm is, is um, organic and uh, I got ROC, which is regenerative organic certified, which is really difficult to get. And we got it done, uh, went through extensive uh, audits and, um, and it's, it's a lot, but yeah. we're one of the few certified organic certified, uh, regenerative or organic certified in Idaho. And, um, uh, cause we're trying to, because that's what the industry wants. The industry, when you look into the food service, they are really wanting regenerative farming practices, the consumers wanting it, the, um, and rightfully so. I mean, I'm really impressed with what Pat's done. It's, I'm very impressive. I, uh, um, he's, he's on the right track. And I also want to concur with him. When you are thinking outside the box, the older thinkers are ridiculing you a little bit. But who gives a shit? 
because it's not what you make, it's what you keep, right? And my whole goal is to take everything from my community, my neighbors and our farms or whatever, and bring it in, clean it, polish it, put in one pound bag and put it in retail stores. You know, we have installed a gluten-free flour mill where we are uh, making quinoa and buckwheat flour and cornmeal and uh, oat flour and uh, lentil flour and all these other products. And we're also, I just got back from Korea and Japan and we're doing quite a bit of business with uh, Korea and Japan right now with buckwheat. That picture that Courtney sh showed earlier, if you want to throw that back up, Courtney, I can talk about that. This right here is buckwheat. This is a 60 day crop and we plant this behind a uh, hard red winter wheat. So this right here <clears throat> was thrashed and this buckwheat was planted and this is gluten free uh, because all your residue and everything, when you thrash and, and, and then no-till this in, um, this stuff comes really fast. And the bees go crazy in this buckwheat. They just love it. What happened when Ukraine and Russia invaded Ukraine, a lot of buckwheat was going to the Asia market. And when they started that war, that disrupted that whole thing. Asia market is really big on buckwheat because it's super healthy. Number one is this makes a great cover crop. Uh and so we go in there behind the wheat and then plant this. And this uh, buckwheat is also known as a phosphate pump. My soil test that I had, and I think last time Courtney and the group came down to the mill or went to the, the uh, cafeteria, they saw my, my uh, nutrient, uh, my uh, soil test. And, you know, everybody's saying, well, you, you know, I had a fertilizer salesman friend of mine, like you guys are mining the soil, you know, you can't do that, you know, whatever. But when you look at my soil test, uh, my soil is completely well balanced. It's a really good shape. And because of when we harvest this, that's a phosphate pump. It's kind of a nitrogen. It, has, it provides a little bit of nitrogen, not as much as like peas do. But for whatever reason, this helps us with better yields, the crop behind it. Then I come in right with sheep, and I, I don't know if I sent you a picture of sheep or not, Courtney, but anyway, uh, this is sheep that's out there right now. I took the other day and uh, anyway, but that's just a small band. That's, that's They're just beginning to bring them in. So these sheep will sit there and go all over the fields when they get done and they'll mob graze it. And um, so, you know, with the urine and the pellets from the sheep and, and then, but going behind that, that uh, buckwheat, um, you know, we're just having good yield results and, and I don't have to haul in any manure or anything of that nature. I'm just letting the sheep, uh, do the magic. And, um, so that's, that's our practice. You know, we come in there, uh, the, uh, you know, Marlon, yes, we are playing with millet. We are, uh, I just saw that, uh, message from Marlon. We are working on a ready to eat product. And uh, millet, uh, sorghum, a kind of a gluten-free product that we're looking into planting because we we're going to a ready to eat. We're trying to put a beans and a and a bunch of health products into a retort package in a cup that you can uh, heat it up and eat in 60 seconds. Um, when I was over in Korea and Japan, uh, and also when you look at the demographics in the United States, the households are shrinking. People aren't getting married, they're getting divorced, or they're not getting remarried, or their wives don't want to cook, and kids are on the fly, and the market is really looking for a healthy product that is ready to eat on the fly. What was super interesting in Korea was the gals there was saying, I don't even want a retort bag because I dirty a bowl and I have to wash that bowl. All I want is, you know, I want to be able to eat that bowl and then throw that bowl in the recycling bin to get recycled. And that's the way it is in Korea. And so it's getting that way here with inflation going around the world. Um, the kids aren't having kids. The population in Japan is shrinking. Korea is the same problem. And, and you're going to start seeing uh, our population growth uh, slow down as well because uh, the young girls and, and men um, are looking at rents going up, their vehicles, payments, and the cost of living and, and, and whatever. And so they can't afford the kids and they're, they're, uh, you know, anyway, so that, that's kind of the demographics of that. Um, what we are growing, uh, is popcorn. 
that's going to go into Costco uh, here shortly, an eight pound case pack, and then um, some black beans. And then um, we are uh, got brokers on the East Coast and the North Cal region and stuff like that, putting beans and uh, other products in the retail stores. Um, and we're also, uh, like I say, we, we got we to gotta really get into the ready to eat because um, people aren't going to cook a pot of beans anymore. You know, they're just not going to do it. I mean, they can because they instant pot and all this stuff and they can feed their whole family for under $4. When they take their family of four, let's say hypothetically, they're going to spend $40 when they could feed their whole family for four. But even though that's the case, they'll go for convenience over, you know, preparedness. And um, anyway, that's just kind of that. Um, I don't, in the ancient grains of blue corn, I could say this. When you get into these ancient grains, I hope you blue corn that goes back 2000 years, that stuff uh, draws bees. I don't know what it is about the ancient grains and the Tibetan purple barley that we grow and stuff like it's, that. It's just so beneficial to you know, the Silas there and Janus. So, anyway, that, that's all I got to share. Thanks, Tim. That's really great. I love hearing about your operation. You're doing something so unique and you're trying to find uh, the needs and meet those needs. Um, but yeah, so we can take any questions for Tim. Yeah. Hello, Tim. It's it's Sean Neild. Um, I, I've got a question for you about your uh, about your mill operation. And I'm wondering if um, other people are other producers in the area are coming to you for um, milling um or and or if there's other people in your area that are starting to grow some more alternative uh grains and the reason why i'm, I'm just i'm really interested in this is we look at what's been typically grown in idaho and 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 how do we how do we increase the diversity in the crops that we grow is a big question in my mind and it, and it seems like if you can get another uh cash crop in the ground something that pays well and some of these markets seem like they would have good margin um, it just seems like a great idea what you've done with the mill, like a real benefit to the to the ag community. So I'm just wondering what kind of interest and in, in work you might be doing with other producers. Yeah, so I mean, I'm uh, uh, I, what, what I love about this business is I meet a lot of really good operators like Pat. I'm super impressed with Pat. And then and and I got some guys, uh, Lauren and a, another young kid over there um, in the eastern part of Idaho that's doing regenerative no till. They're planting the rye, rolling it no till it in and the pictures are showing me is just blowing my mind to how clean their bean fields are um and as far as uh other growers yes we've got growers that we're trying to expand contracts with but we're a young company we're just getting started as we grow we want to network and have this you know relationship with other farmers that we can source and provide and we, we want them to have the same mindset that we have you know with just you know just like pat there you know he's doing it right and i I'm, I'm really impressed and so and i think a lot of guys are seeing it and the thing is though when i was in argentina um i was backpacking through argentina years ago and what was so interesting the equipment was so expensive down there that they no-tilled and that's when i really got exposed to no-till was down there and the deep soil is so deep and so rich that none of the farmers owned any equipment in Argentina. Well, they owned a pickup and, and they lived in town and they didn't live on the farm, but they went out to the farm, but they contracted all their no-till and all their harvesting and everything was done because they could afford good equipment and run a lot across a lot of acres. And they had a formula that they worked out with their uh, uh, custom guys. And so it was super interesting to see that. And I see that now, you know, when you're sitting here with a, a, a tractor costing a thousand dollars of horsepower and then your neighbor across the field has all this new equipment, it's starting to make more sense to me to pay him to come over and, and, and do my custom farming. And I, I know I got off the beat path there a little bit, but uh, I see more farms, uh, you know, switching over to the no-till because I think their costs are going to go down. And I think even though the yield may slip a little bit, the net the net profit goes up. So this is what I'm looking forward to. The other thing that I'm really excited about that's coming down the road with crop diversity is this robotic camera technology that's going to be coming down the road. 
Now they've got some laser weeders, but they're $1.4 million. They go too slow. They cost too much money. But what I see happening is with these electric trucks that they got, these little slide in units, I see these 30 foot booms with, I see these, uh, when I go to these robotic shows, you'll see a robotic arm uh, move a ping pong ball. A hundred ping pong balls will be in this deal. You'll plug in seven balls and that'll move them, them balls in that order in a blink of an eye. I see ro kind of like roguing field uh, units crawling through the field at a mile and a half, two miles an hour, being able to identify seven to eight to 15 plant uh, weeds, your nightshade, your red root, your, you know, all that stuff, going to be able to hand remove that. Also monitor plant disease and, and be able to say, okay, you've got an insect infestation starting right here. Here's your hot spot. And then you run out there with your beneficial bugs. And I think this technology is not far away and it's going to get more affordable and it's going to get better. And so I, I think that uh, I'm excited for that, uh, for that day to come along. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I think the, uh, you know, having alternative um, alternatives to uh, typical rotations and uh, that milling operation available in your areas is super great. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, real interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the gluten-free market is getting bigger. It's funny, I mean, because the celiacs is such a problem. When you talk about your ancient grains, when you go over to Europe, you can eat all the bread you want and you, you don't have any problems. It's like a meal, whatever. I talked to a, a chemist and he explained to me who had celiacs in the worst way. And he explained to me, and, and I'm not saying I'm not, I'm just repeating what he said. I'm not saying it's right. But when you go into the more older ancient grains, on the on the on the einkorn, the, the the spelt, the stuff like that. There's only 14 chromosomes in that grain. When we get to these new varieties that have been bred up to for plant disease and higher yield and all that stuff, we've gone up to 42 chromosomes. We've changed them chromosomes so fast that our biome of our gut isn't able to handle it, and I think that's what's triggering a lot of the celiacs. And so when you go over to Europe, and you eat their bread and you spend, you know, whatever, they don't even think about wheat or celiacs. It's not even, that's an American thing, you know, or, you know, other countries. But I think that uh, they also, the way they do their flour is different and they don't extract all the minerals and they leave the brand in and they leave it more whole grain. And so it's super interesting when you go to that part of the world where people are thinner, healthier, uh, you start monitoring less preservatives. And when you uh, go over there and experience a European lifestyle, you come to the United States and I've been traveling a lot. I've been in Dubai, been in Japan twice and Korea. Um, you know, I, I backpacked all through Europe and 14 uh, all over the country over there, spent 30 days there. And just in South America, I did the same thing in Argentina and Uruguay. But the thing is that when you travel, and you look at the people and the diet and how they live, and then you land in the American airport, it's a night and day difference of what you see. And uh, it's just amazing that we, you know, we got we to gotta start following what these older countries are, are eating and doing and mimic that. Awesome. Thank you. That's a great discussion. Brad, did you have a question? Yeah, Tim is Brad Johnson. Uh, with yeah. your buckwheat, does are you only doing organic buckwheat at this time? No, uh, no. So <clears throat> I do organic. The Japanese want uh, they'll they'll take anything we grow. They're taking all the organic, and then they'll they'll take as much conventional as we're willing to grow. Uh, the Koreans uh, also. Uh, Korean Korea is is really super difficult because they have a tariff, and if you don't get everything. Uh, Re received by the 20th to the 25th of December, then it goes to 140% tariff tax. So it's super sensitive to get that done. We we grew other acres in Bruno and Caldwell and other places of the buckwheat and then brought it in, cleaned it, and we're shipping it overseas now. And um, uh, so, and what I love about it is such a healthy for the soil. It's so good for the bees. And, and that's why I'm excited about getting this crop into the conventional guys' hands. And it really works well in the Bruno area as well as Caldwell because it's a little bit warmer. Those guys thrash early. 
as long as you get that buckwheat planted by the end of the first week of August, then and then you're good to go. Uh, it, it, Tim, it, is there it, not a big issue with with uh, growing buckwheat in a in a wheat producing area though? I thought that buckwheat and 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 wheat were just like you couldn't you couldn't even think about them in the same sentence. No, no, I, I don't find that at all. I mean, because when you thrash that buckwheat, uh, it's it. I mean, it, if it smells a freeze, it does, wants to die, and so, um, and the, it's a broadleaf. So when you go in there with any other crop, it's it's. Uh, I'm not having any issues with it organically. So I, I don't know why. It's kind of funny. Somebody did something 20 years ago, and and someone you know made an issue out of something. But sometimes what you was told to be true isn't true. I don't see any issue with whatsoever. If you need more acres, I've got a few guys here in Eastern Idaho. One in Aberdeen, <laughs> the other one up in Rexburg area that would love to grow some buckwheat for you. Yeah, and so the, the thing is, though, on the double crop side, when you go from Twin Falls, uh, maybe from Kimberley area, you kind of want to go to the west because it's got lo longer growing days. When uh, when you go towards Pocatello and Idaho Falls that way, um, you're, you guys freeze earlier and have more issues. So it, it is, uh, we, you know. We do it, we do it behind, a, behind a winter cover crop, plant it in probably June middle of June here and get it off and then plan another cover. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that would work. That would work. Yeah. Um, Tim, and we have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Marlon's asking if you've planted Kamut. Kamut, no, I haven't planted any Kamut yet. I, um, yeah, that's a good grain. Uh, they're doing that over there. There's a guy by the name of Bob it's over there by Great Falls, Montana. It's a hell of a guy. Uh, he's got that uh, Kamut. Uh, he owns a patent of the Kamut, actually. Um, uh, so you have to pay a royalty to Bob on that Kamut. And then there's um, another name I forget for that variety. That's really good for the biome of the gut. Uh, Kamut is a horrible yielder. It gets tall, lodges. It doesn't yield well. That's why it's so expensive to store. Um, and then another question, Tim, did you graze the sheep exclusively on the buckwheat or was there a mix of other plants? Yeah, so the, I, I bring the sheep on and hit the whole farm. So I'll, um, so like I'll put a pea kelp, uh, 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 a kelp, let's see, no one, what is it? It's a, uh, God, what is that variety? Anyway, I, I, I'll, I'll put in a, a pea, the volunteer grain, and then I'll put a uh, tillage radish and then I'll put a, um, and I'm forgetting the name of it. It's a, it's a broadleaf, uh, good, good, uh, good cover crop mix. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll have the sheep graze that as well. So I'll, I'll let them hit everything, not just the button. Thank you. Um, and just a general comment from Steve saying how much he loves working with you. And that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Steve's, Steve's awesome. <laughs> But I would okay. like to have Pat's phone number, if you would. Pat, would you give me your phone number? Oh, wait. 208-631-7788. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. A great job. A very fascinating what you're doing. I think that's that's amazing. Well, it's stressful and uh, bumping heads with the big retailers and um, – and now that Kroger is merging with Albertsons and whatever, it even makes it even a little bit more difficult. Um, there's a slight raping that takes place when you get into retail because they want to uh, nail you for retail shelf space. And then you got to get a lot of turns to justify that. So it's it's quite a game. So uh, you got to have iron iron guts to play what I'm doing right now. Well, well I appreciate you what, what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad that we're making some connections here today. Well, yeah, and I, that's why I put my number out there. If, if anybody, you know, we're looking for future growers as we expand. We want the right people with the right mindset to be our, our suppliers. Awesome. Thanks for making the pitch. Mm -hmm. um, great. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Thanks for your time today. Um, and our next presenter is Lance Griff. Yeah, so let me get my screen shared here. That look good? Looks great. 
Okay, so my name is Lance Griff. Um, I farm with my dad uh, south of Filer, south of Twin Falls, out on the salmon track. And um, yeah, I'll just start going through this. So I kind of did a before and after comparison. Um, we grow wheat, corn, barley, and alfalfa, and we've shifted a little bit. We used to grow dry beans as well, but in our kind of regenerative ag uh, journey, we couldn't, we could find, we want, I wanted to find a stand up bean variety that I could just uh, either swath or just stump. And we, they're out there, but they're too long for our season out here. We're high enough uh, elevation that it just doesn't work very well. So, you know, beans, if you've grown beans before, in my opinion, they're a pain. There's mold issues. There's, you know, they can blow the, you know, they're just a pain in my opinion. So we grow, quit growing beans. So anyway, before we were uh, no-till and reduced till, we, um, we didn't do any plowing because we have a lot of rocks out here. We did lots of disking. And so the high-speed disk is and was the main tillage to uh, tool. Um, the biggest reduction in tillage, <coughs> excuse me, was between the wheat and the corn crop. So typically we'll plant uh, our corn after the wheat. And so we were under full tillage, we would do approximately three uh, disc passes before the corn was planted and uh, one dam or dike pass uh, to hold the moisture, hold the water as the pivot was going around in you know, any kind of row crop, whether that was the corn, whether that was the beans, because we just couldn't, you know, the, the ground would take the moisture for the first few passes and then it would, it would seal off, you know, because we didn't have, we had ruined our soil structure with all that disking. So um, that was kind of our typical, we had, you know, four tillage passes, three disking and one dam or dike pass. So after the adoption of no-till, there's zero tillage between wheat and corn. All three disc passes are eliminated and we don't, we don't use the dam or diker anymore since the water um, infiltrates now. Um, this fall, we experimented with drilling wheat directly into the corn silage stubble. Um, uh, so we eliminated another disc pass. That was the picture on the first slide there. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what, uh, what we're doing now. So under the old system, you know, like I was saying before, three tillage passes with the, with the disc, one dam or dike pass after emergence, and we didn't use any manure. And so basically there was no residue left on the surface to protect soil from blowing um, or the impact of the raindrops or, you know, pivot, pivot drops, uh, pivot raindrops that are, are being applied. So we just had over the years, just poor water infiltration in our row crops. Um, you know, so the pivots had to be run much faster to prevent, to prevent the runoff. Um, you know, we had a necessity of dam or diking to hold the water because of that poor infiltration. We had bigger pivot tracks. We had more trouble with pivots getting stuck because you had water running down the pivot tracks. And we just had really poor soil health, uh, low worm populations, no soil aggregation, you know, no residue left on the soil surface. So under the new system, um, we've eliminated four tillage passes. Like I was saying, I, I figured $22 an acre for four passes is, is $88 an acre, but we have to subtract, subtract off a pass for our sprayer. So um, rather than um, having a disc pass out there to control weeds right before we plant the corn, I'll run my sprayer across the field. And like Pat, we own our own sprayer and like him, um, I would much rather make a pass across with the sprayer. Um, I can cover so many more acres in a day. It's just cheaper per acre to run a, a sprayer across the field. So um, we use less nitrogen now. So we've kind of tweaked our system as well, where we spread 18 to 20 tons of raw manure every other year. So in the fall, after the wheat crop has come off, um, since we don't do beans anymore, which we would normally be cutting beans, we'd be thrashing beans, um, that kind of a thing. We instead move to spreading manure. We own our own manure spreaders. They're a vertical beater type spreader. So we have manure hauled um, to our pivot corners, um, either the previous fall or the next spring for the, the upcoming fall that we, we want to use it in. So we put, pivot, we put manure on our pivot corners and and then we come through with our, our vertical uh, beater manure spreaders, which spread manure 
gosh, you know, 50, 60 feet, if you wanted to, we're typically go on 30 foot passes. And um, so we spread about 18 to 20 tons of manure directly on the wheat stubble. Um, and then when we go to plant the corn, we typically put out about 80 units of, of nitrogen dry right before planting, or typically we try to do it before a rainstorm to get it into the ground. And I kind of look at that as, as, as starting to break down um, the residue that's there. Um, I know it's going to get tied up there anywhere. And in the manure that I've put out, it's going to get tied up. So I basically kind of look at that as being tied up in that, but I, I know I'm going to get it back. And then we put on about 65 units of nitrogen through the pivot um, uh, throughout the season. So as I kind of went through before, we spread manure in the fall on the wheat stubble ground, and then we no-till plant our corn directly into that next year. So we just spread the raw manure on, plant right into it the next uh, spring. So the total cost of fertilizer between our old and our new system is roughly the same, but we're using a lot less synthetic fertilizer and a lot more manure. So, you know, as we all know, the benefits of manure, we gladly, you know, trade a portion of the synthetic fertilizer for, man for the manure with all of its benefits. Um, even though the cost of fertilizer is roughly the same, we're actually getting about 20 bushel better in our wheat yields. And it, it's, it's hard to quantify, you know, is this from the, ma the manure application? Is this better overall soil health? Is it a combination of the two? So I didn't include this in, in my, my cost or my, my uh, figures, um, economic figures, but, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's both. I think, in my opinion, it's both the manure and it's uh, better soil health. So bottom line, um, we save $88 an acre in tillage costs, but we have to subtract off that $15 an acre for burn down spray ahead of the corn instead of a tillage pass. So we figure about $73 an acre savings over the old system. Um, I feel like the corn yields are, yields are similar in both systems. Um, and in our system, the real savings comes from the reduced tillage. And like I said, I didn't figure the higher wheat yields in, but um, obviously that is a, a, if you're figuring soil health total, like looking at soil health totally, um, then yes, that is a huge benefit. Um, but as far as just like cutting out tillage passes, um, you know, I didn't figure that in. So this past fall, like I was saying, we direct seeded our winter wheat into our corn, corn silage stubble, and we got an excellent stand. So um, that it's possible to save another one to two tillage passes more over what we are currently doing because we typically have disc our ground once or twice with a high speed disc before we drill our wheat, um, just due to when the, the silage choppers come in, um, depending on how long we've had the water off, uh, between when they get there and when we turn the water off, we can sometimes get some compaction just from the choppers, from the trucks. But we, you know, the choppers showed up later than what we thought they would this year. And so the ground was actually, you know, quite dry. And so we didn't get any compaction really to speak of. So we just had Richard Hawks come in with his no-till drill and just drill directly into, uh, into the, the corn wheat stubble. And we had gotten a nice rain um, uh, not long before Richard got there. And so it worked excellent. And we got an excellent stand, so it may be possible to eliminate that tillage pass or two, so which would save us another twenty to forty dollars an acre on what what we're doing now. Um, some of the side benefits, I just kind of included those because it's, I mean, there's often things we don't think about, but you know, more time to do other things. You know, if you want to take on more ground, if you want, you know, to spend more time with your family, it just gives you more options. Equipment lasts longer since you're not making all those passes across the field. So, you know, our sprayer gets more acres on it, more hours on it, but it's certainly cheaper than running, you know, a disc across the field. So now we get excellent water infiltration, which, which leads to better water use efficiency. Um, I talk about it a little bit lower down in this paragraph, uh, so I'll get to it then. Um, but the soil armor of residue left from the wheat stubble and manure then protects the, from wind and water erosion. And like Pat was saying, you know, it would just make us sick to see our soil blown away in the, in the spring. We get so much wind in the spring, we just, you know, that's where, that's where your most productive soil is on that topsoil and you're seeing it blow away. And also the water erosion, you know, we get, 
Um, we get a big, heavy, you know, thunderstorm in the middle of the summer, and I'd worry about, oh man, did all my dikes just break from my dam or dike or pass? Because you know, did we get a, a big, a big thunderstorm that put down a whole bunch of water and broke all my dikes out there in the field, and now I got water and fertilizer running through the field. Um, so we get healthier plants and soil by reducing and eliminating tillage. As like I was saying on an above point, why I'm able to run my pivots much, much slower. So there's less wear and tear on the pivots um, just because they're moving slower and I don't, it doesn't take so many passes to put on the same amount of water. And that's been really great to just be more efficient with the water and um, yeah, and just, and just be more, much more efficient. So like I, I said in a previous slide as well, uh, shallower pivot track, so it's easier on equipment. Like for the chopper guys, they, they love, you know, chopping our fields because we're not, we don't have these huge deep tracks anymore. Um, we get much better soil structure that's uh, resist to to, resistant to compaction. So just as an example, like as water goes, as the pivot goes by, I can walk out there or I've, I've even hauled in um fertilizer trailers behind my pickup just right after the pivot has gone past because i've got that structure now and i've got residue on the surface that resists that compaction so i know i'm headed in the right direction and i see a whole bunch more worms now you know you stick a shovel on the ground that's my main tool i use to see how my soil is doing um you know i just see worms now i see worm channels i see worms i see, I see better structure it's just a, a huge benefit um the soil holds water much longer now due to that residue cover like i was talking about with better water use efficiency and we just get decreased pest pressure so those are some benefits that we've seen so these are just a few pictures the one on the left there the bigger one we tried some 44 inch row corn this year rather than our typical 22 inch and we um, use an interseeder and put some cover crop in there just to kind of see what we could do. Because, you know, in our, in our system, we don't have a lot of diversity in the system since we took the beans out. So I'm using the, um, the cover crops, different species, to kind of give me some diversity in the corn. And because I'll go into wheat after this. So I'm trying to get some, some diversity in there. The top right picture is us planting. When we did grow beans, I planted some a stand-up variety bean into this cover crop of barley and um, wheat and then I just came back in and sprayed out the, the barley and wheat and the beans came up to the the cover crop there planting green and and it was it looks I thought it looked great I mean it took like a month month and a half till I could even see the beans but um, it worked really good and then the bottom right picture is just you know you can see the residue that's there from the wheat from the previous year, the wheat stubble, as well as you can't see a lot of manure there, but it's there. And um, so those are just a few pictures of, of the operation. So any questions? Um, Lance Marlin wanted to know if you guys have your own no-till drill. We do not. We have been using Richard for many years now and he does a great job for us so um, we have our own planter that's a no-till planter but we typically just hire richard to come to come drill for us and lance i just wanted to say thanks for listing out all of the uh the side benefits that you did um i find that that's there's there's so many things that are difficult to quantify, but that come up as benefits of implementing some of these practices that it's um, that the list could be extensive like yours was. And and the, the fact that you're building soil structure and it, it's re resulting in getting less, if, you know, you're not getting equipment stuck, you're able to drive on it. I mean, it means there's a greater microbial community in there, reinforcing their your 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 soil structure, uh, which means your organic matter is going up. Which just one percent organic matter in in soil to pull out, if you were to pull out the nitrogen amount back of the envelope math, would bring you to about twelve hundred pounds of nitrogen per acre in that one percent organic matter, and and and. Nobody ever really talks about that, you know, how that that nutrient bank in in the soil really really does have a a, a high value. Um, but it's you know it's like you were saying these some of these things are hard to quantify. So I really appreciate you 
pulling up those those side benefits. It was a great list. Hey, Lance, this is Pat Purdy. Uh, I want to compliment you on your excellent presentation and the work you're doing as well. Uh, uh, I'm glad you brought up the point about the center pivots. That's a huge factor for those of us who run pivots and are used to having to deal with stuck pivots, you know, every day pivots getting stuck, gearboxes and center drives tearing out. And when that goes away, it's, it's just an unbelievable relief and, uh, um, and you know, just kind of a change in your whole mentality. You don't have to get up every morning and wonder, you know, how many, <laughs> how many pivots do I got to go get and stuck today? Or what got stuck last night and sat there and watered in one place and the valve didn't shut off and flooded the field. I mean, they're just all, so there's just a huge side benefit to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, Pat. You don't, yeah. You, like you say, you don't wake up and think, Oh boy, what, what messes am I going to find this morning? We've, we've, uh, just had less maintenance on the pivots and it's just nice to run them slower and put water down and be more efficient with it. Lance, you mentioned the efficiency and the, and the, the water at one point, it seems like you, you and I talked a, a, about this and you had mentioned uh, the amount of, of decreased uh, application required for, I think it was corn. And I, I remember being kind of blown away. Do you, do you have those figures? Yeah. You know, just from come, kind of rough figuring, I figure it's an inch or two less um, in what you can get away with putting on. And um, yeah, I just think the soil, since it's covered, it just, you know, it's not evaporating nearly as fast. And it seems, it just seems like it holds moisture so much better. Um, like the, the choppers this year got to us, like it was about three weeks, I want to say, from when we turned our water off to when they got there. And even after they got there, I could go with my shovel and I could still find pretty decent moisture. And it wasn't compacting the soil at all, but there was just, it just seems to hold moisture so much better. That's super impressive. Any other questions for Lance? Uh, there's a comment from Taryn. Um, said, listen to a guy growing hard red wheat with the Johnson Sioux bioreactor compost tea injected in row. Says the flour from that wheat is tolerated by those with an intolerance to gluten. This guy is in Canada. Interesting. Hmm. And I know, I don't know if uh, Tyson Meeks is on, but he farms out in the Middleton area. And I know he uses the Johnson Sioux reactor um uh, method and utilizes some of the uh, uh, they they wash some of that material that's cured in the the Johnson Sioux reactor. They wash some of that material out and um, capture the the effluent from the washing and apply that through their irrigation lines. If I remember that right, he thought that was a high uh, uh, gave his gave his plants in the early season a real 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 good vigor and gave them an advantage. Yeah, and uh, Courtney, I want to uh, say something about Lance. You know, I'm just impressed. It's nice to see young farmers like Lance, so proactive. Uh, you know, I just can't say enough about Lance. He, I, I, Whatever Lance does, I'm paying attention. You know, I, I end up buying one of his old stripper headers because he he had that figured out. And uh, we, we uh, and he, I think you sold your other stripper header over to, to, to Funks, didn't you, Lance? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah, we, we ended up getting some organic buckwheat from him. He had success uh, with some buckwheat over there in uh, Murtaugh. Great crop. That stripper hitter did a beautiful job. And uh, anyway, you know, we just need a whole shitload more lances out there in the world. So that's all I can say. <laughs> well, thanks for the compliment, Tim. Appreciate it. You bet. And I always enjoy your presentations and your talks because like Steve said, you're so enthusiastic and you're always trying something new. So it's always good to pick your brain. I'm glad, I'm glad we're all crazy together. That's what's awesome. So much appreciation for each other. It's great to hear. Um, and I just needed to address this comment real quick. Tyson, I see your comment. Um, wanting to hear more from um, Tim and Pat about their numbers specifically. I would recommend that you um, try giving them a call 
I think that would probably be the best if you want to hear more about those numbers. Um, yeah, well, does anybody have any last questions for any of our, I think all of our presenters are still on. If anybody has any last questions before we wrap up. No one would even know this is a knife and that's because. And I guess not. So uh, yeah, I wanna say, say thank you again so much to our three producers for presenting. Like Marlon said, total legends in Southern Idaho. Um, and yeah, this was a really wonderful, five for five. Great to hear about soil health economics finally. So thank you all so much for coming. And this will be the recording of this will be on our YouTube page that I put in the chat in probably about a week or so. So look out for that if you have any more questions or want to take another look. And thank and you, Courtney, Courtney, for all you do. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Courtney. Thanks, Thanks, Courtney. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.